Well, welcome everybody to the fourth uh, series of our nutritional nutrition and cancer WebEx series with Dr. Deanna Minich, brought to you by Harmony Hill. Uh, again, my name is Elaine Holland, and I'm Harmony Hill's executive director. Um, if you've been on before, you know we're a nonprofit retreat center founded over 25 years ago by Gretchen Shoney here on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, just two hours west of Seattle. Um, I, I, I'm just going to say that Harmony Hill, you can learn more about us at HarmonyHill.org. But men, I do want to mention one thing, that we are having our third annual survivorship fair on Saturday, August 25th. So this is a free event, which includes lunch, and it's um, available for anyone with cancer, their caregivers, as well as anyone interested in cancer prevention and wellness. So please come out to Harmony Hill on the 25th if you'd like. It's going to be a wonderful um, day. We've got a whole um, uh, array of speakers and uh, activities planned, and um, Deanna will ha actually has two topics on that day, one in the morning, Everything you were afraid to ask about everything you wanted to know about nutrition was afraid to ask. Was that correct, Deanna? Yeah, just think of that Woody Allen movie. I, I kind of leveraged yeah. his his creative genius and stole that title. <laughs> but I inserted nutrition. Everything you always wanted to know about nutrition, but were afraid to ask. Right. And then the top foods to eat and avoid is your afternoon topic. So it's going to be a wonderful day. So come on out on the 25th. Um, the reason Harmony Hill is sponsoring this series is that we believe that nutrition is good nutrition is p pivotal for cancer prevention, and um, or we've done it for the first time in July. This is the first time Harmony Hill has ever done any sort of webinar series, and due to the very popular response, both on the evening as well as the follow-up sessions that we've posted online, we'll be doing it again in October. And um, after this evening, we'll be designing and sending out a survey to get your feedback on how to make these even more inspirational and informative for you. So at this point, I'd like to reintroduce you to Dr. Deanna Minich. Um, Deanna has over 20 years of experience in the fields of nutrition, wellness, and healing. Um, and if you've listened to the other series, you probably know her bio as well as I do, so <laughs> I'm going to synthesize it and say that we appreciate her so much because of her unique approach. She can take seemingly contradictory or opposite um, disciplines and put them together, science and spirituality, practicality and poetry. I just love this body and soul. And most importantly, though, I, I, I'm a big advocate of personal growth and using our relationship with nutrition as a domain to explore our personal growth is something that I think she does that's just so fascinating. As you know, she's got her Ph.D. in nutrition. And um, please use your chat feature tonight if you have a question throughout the series. So with that, Deanna, tonight you're going to pull it all together, I think, is the title. Um, and we really look forward to yet another informative session. Great. Thank you so much, Elaine, and welcome, everybody, to our final webinar tonight. And again, I'd like to thank Harmony Hill for sponsoring this series. This has been uh, wonderful to do and very generous on behalf of Harmony Hill, so thank you. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have a lot of fun. We are going to be putting what we have been learning about nutrition, starting off with food as medicine, talking about the skinny on fats, and then last week talking about keeping balanced weight. And now you are probably wondering, well, what's the news to use and how do I weave together everything that you just talked about and make meals healthy and meaningful for me in my life? So that's what we're going to do. We are going to um, enter into the terrain of application of everything that we talked about. So one of the things um, to really point out here is how important it is to have your health. And I think that there's a quote, I think it's from Benjamin Franklin, who said, without your health, or health is wealth. And it really is, because if you don't have your health, you really can't do much. So it's really important to take care of that and to, to nourish yourself as best you can. In fact, what's really interesting is that there's a difference between our lifespan, how long we live, 
and our quality of life, also known as our health span. And I think about people living into their later years, into their seventh, their eighth, their ninth, their tenth decades, and some of them are incredibly vital, and they are up and about doing different things. In fact, I was just talking with my fiancé today about his 85-year-old father and how he just he has this amazing vitality to him. And what makes those people so vital? Is it their genes? Yes. Is it their lifestyle? Yes. It's, it's more or less a combination of those two things. So, and of course, I can imagine that all of you would want to live into your, your later decades in a, um, in a framework of, of health and vitality. So one of the first things to do, we're already diving into the practicality, is visualize your success. I am very um, bullish about guided imagery and visioning. If we don't vision where we're going, then we won't create the kind of the energetic template to get there. And it's been shown time and time again in scientific studies and also in clinical practice. I worked with an oncologist who definitely used guided imagery techniques with his patients. Practice seeing yourself going through the change and actually being whatever you, you choose to be. So if it's healthy, if it's vital, if it's bright, radiant, mobile, functional, whatever it is, being in that place of action is really important. So coming from that place of empowerment will really set the stage for everything else to line up. I wrote a book on this concept uh, called The Complete Handbook of Quantum Healing, and Harmony Hill does carry this book, and it's a reference book. It's really taking you through all the different chronic conditions, everything from acne to yeast infections, and gives these really um, detailed guided imagery techniques to help you visualize getting into your body and imagining things differently. It also goes through nutrition and a number of other modalities for these different conditions. So let's walk through, um, you know, since we're focused on food, we are going to go to food first. But it is good to have that, that visualization to start with, right? Whether it means taking out a picture from one of your photo albums of how you used to look and the body weight that you were or the, the glimmer in your eyes that you had, and then to start changing your, your behavior and habits around food. Because essentially every bite of food that we take becomes the destiny of who we are. That food becomes a part of us. So here are the seven key principles of a healthy diet and lifestyle. The first one, and many of these are going to be very intuitive. You're going to already recognize a number of these. I'm not going to throw you any curveballs here. I think um, you'll be very much in sync with me. It's more or less creating that level of awareness again. So the first point is to reduce the intake of meat and other animal foods. In general, we as a culture and a society, and I know that there are people from a lot of different places on the, on the globe um, listening to this, and what I would say is that it, it could be variable depending on where you live, but for the most part, we take in too many animal foods. So that would be cheese, milk, meat products. And the reason why it might be of interest for us to look at that in what we're eating is because of the fat content I talked about that in the Skinny on Fats webinar where we talked about this highly saturated animal fat not being very good for our heart and our vasculature. And also, if you think of the fatty products that come from animals, typically it's the fat that acts as a sinkhole for a lot of these different pesticides and insecticides, herbicides, a lot of these toxins that are in our environment. If you do choose to, to eat meat, and it's not that I'm uh, in favor of being vegan. I think every person is very different, and I think if we can gauge the type of animal food that we eat and make sure that it's grass-fed, um, organically raised uh, animal products, then I think you're, you're going to be much better off. And I know that organic is more expensive, but here's the place where you'd want to spend for organically grown or um, fed products, definitely here in the animal foods. So with meat consumption, what's a general guideline? So it, being that, uh, that 
cancer is the focus for Harmony Hill. What I did put in here is just some tidbits around meat consumption and cancer, especially for colorectal cancer where there is an association with meat consumption, with um, eating too much in the way of processed meat every day, so roughly the size of one jumbo hot dog a day. Um, that their risk of colorectal cancer could be 36% higher than someone who eats no processed meat. And if the person eats seven ounces of processed meat every day, his risk will be 72% higher. So that's basically two jumbo hot dogs per day. So in processed meat, that includes things like hot dogs, bacon, sausage, and lunch meat. So this comes from the um, uh, American... Uh, Institute of Cancer Research site, which I, I took a number of, of different facts from. So healthy selections if you want to eat meat. The first point is to limit your intake to no more than three to four ounces per day. Choose really lean cuts, less than 5% of fat if you can. And I think it's really important to avoid consuming well-done, charbroiled, fat-laden meats so if you think of when you put meat on a grill and you get those, those black or those brown lines, essentially that product that's formed is considered to be very inflammatory in the body when we ingest those browning products. Those browning products actually um, have been thought to be a marker of aging if we have too many of those in the body. Another point is um, not to eat a lot of cured meat a lot of these processed meats that I was alluding to. And the, the, the flip side here of what would be good to consume if you choose to consume meat would be free-range meats or wild game such as grass-fed beef or buffalo. Buffalo can be very lean, actually, um, as can venison and ostrich. So those would be good choices, probably not as accessible to many people, but definitely um, good choices. The second point is to eat the good essential fats. We spent a lot of time talking about fats and oils, and in general what I discussed here is if you have an imbalance of those omega-3 and those omega-6 fats, it might manifest in a lot of different ways. So you might get a skin condition, a dermatitis or scaly skin, hair loss, behavioral issues, inflammation in the body, all kinds of different uh, physiological signs and symptoms. So the takeaway that we had from the um, Skinny on Fats webinar was essentially you want to keep fats in balance. You've got the good fats, which are the omega-3 fats, and you have the, the bad fats, which are the trans fats and saturated fats, the animal-derived saturated fats. So what you'd like to do is really keep a balance within the good fat category looking at the omega-3s to omega-6 ratio. And omega-6 fats are typically found in a lot of seed oils. Things like corn oil, soybean oil tend to have higher amounts of omega-6. Um, the omega-9 fats are the ones that are found in olive oil and avocados, to name just a couple. So those would be um, good sources of fat to eat. Now the, the third point Oh, goodness, what happened here? <laughs> I, I didn't even touch my screen. Something just happened. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm not sure what's happening. Just a second. We'll get back on track. My computer looks like it is um, mysteriously just shutting down. But just a sec, let me get us back to the presentation. Uh, we, Deanna, we still see the, uh, um, the cookie. <laughs> Do you really? Okay, yeah. my computer is basically shutting down, uh, and it looks like it's it's probably going to reboot. But it's very interesting because I haven't touched anything, and it has not done that to me ever before. Wow. So um, let me speak to, um, as it is shutting down and doing its thing here, let me just speak to what um, I was talking about on that cookie slide. Essentially, what I'm referring to there is to really watch your intake of processed foods that are high in sugar. Uh, they can really become an issue with um, our immune system. So if we're eating lots of sugary goods, what we can do is actually depress the immune system for hours after eating them. And sugar comes in many different forms, um, as you well know. 
So it comes in the form of high fructose corn syrup. And uh, in fact, I think high fructose corn syrup is now being called corn sugar, right? So you just have to watch for that clever marketing on labels and um, what things really are. One of the most common sugars that you see on labels that's very well disguised is evaporated cane juice. So, you know, and typically you'll find that in healthy products. It'll say evaporated cane juice, but really this is just a form of sugar. Now, one of the things that I would be showing you in the presentation is that um, on the label, when it has the, the sugars listed, it will actually say how many grams of sugar you have in the serving of that product. What I'd like you to think about there is that a sugar cube is about four grams of sugar. So you can imagine that if you had um, sugar cubes lined up to uh, parallel the number of total grams that were in that serving, you can visualize how much you would be getting in the way of sugar. So um, the, the only exception there is that lactose is also considered to be a sugar. It's counted under the sugar category on the Nutrition Facts label. So if you're eating yogurt, it may look like a lot of sugar, and what you have to realize there is that that's also counting lactose um, in conjunction with any other added sugars. What I okay, typically like just, to do with yogurt... Just, okay, I just wanted to give you an update. I'm sorry to interrupt. We just yeah, please. Still lost, lost the uh, cookie slide, and it's still recording, but it, it has transferred the host of this event over to me. Okay. Well, um, again, I'm not sure what happened, and uh, <laughs> we had talked about potential technical issues, and this is one that I've never had happen, but it's going to come up, and I can still talk through some of the issues okay. um, as it relates to sugar as it slowly comes up, and I apologize for the, the technical glitch here. So um, with sugar, um, it's just a matter of reading the label and avoiding a lot of the, the foods that are processed. And I spoke before about um, supermarket shopping and how staying away from the middle aisles tends to be a better way to navigate the supermarket versus being um, around the, the periphery, the perimeter, and just looking for the produce and um, the, the, the different whole foods that are contained there. I often like to, to um, really leverage the bulk food section, too because you can find a lot of nuts and seeds and, and whole grains in that section um, at more of a reduced price. All right, so let me just see here. My computer is, seems like what While happened bringing was, that up, I, just you know, I, I noticed that when I buy that, as you say about bulk foods, the price of yeah. steel-cut oatmeal in bulk yes. is a fraction of what Bob's I know. Right cut costs. It's just amazing. Yeah, and, and many people, yeah, that, that's right. And sometimes you pay for that brand name, um, whereas if you were just to go into the bulk section and um, get it there where it's not all packaged fancy, fancifully, um, what you end up getting is a, a much um, better priced product for sure. In fact, I've actually run the numbers on eating healthy and it's quite comparable to eating unhealthy, and in fact, it comes in even a little bit lower. So many people have that, that perception that it costs more, but I don't believe that that's the case. So my presentation's coming up, and I'm assuming that you don't see anything at this point because my Internet connection went down, and so I lost uh, the, the webinar connection. But I will pull that up. Here we go. So I've got my presentation back, thank goodness. All right. Now, um, I'll just continue talking while I start to pull yeah, up the WebEx again. If you get again. back online, I can change host back to you. Okay. So the other, um, number four, is to ensure that you eat a rainbow assortment of fruits and vegetables. And I'm sure if you've ever seen me speak in any capacity, I make sure to sneak this one in wherever I can because it is so important to ensure that we are getting good, healthy phytochemicals, um, these plant nutrients, which, you know, this is just a, a little bit of an interesting tidbit, I thought, but 
there was a, uh, a researcher that looked into what the Victorian era in England, uh, what people were eating. And what they found is that they were eating lots of these phytochemicals, and they had different diseases, typically in infectious uh, diseases, but they didn't have all these chronic diseases. So it's just interesting that with the the advent of the agricultural revolution, where we started to get a lot of these processed grain products and processed sugars, that we really started to have a changed food supply that was devoid largely of a number of these different important phytochemicals. So, and there are thousands of them. You know, things like uh, the carotenoids, like the red, yellow, and orange compounds, um, chlorophyll, which is, which is green, uh, and you find that in a lot of leafy vegetables. So I'm going to hit here, join. It says event in progress. It's a good thing that everybody can still hear me, though, because typically when you're, the webinar goes down, you also lose the phone connection. Um, so this is good. Yeah, I see you on the phone, but I think it's because we have it. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> okay. I don't <laughs> Okay, as long as we have everybody else, and, and again, thanks for hanging in there. So, um, okay, now I see I'm going to, I've made Yeah, it's slowly coming up here. And now, okay, now you're back as host. So if you share, yeah. you share Perfect. your desktop, we'll be back in business. Okay. Yep, I see it says you are now the host of this event. We are still recording. And... I just need to share my desktop. So it's not giving me the option to to share it. Change role to presenter. Yes, I'm with the presenter. Okay, now I can share my desktop. Okay. And we see all your email. <laughs> you see it. All right. Okay, so here we are on number four. We're right on track. No worries. Okay, sorry about that. It, all right, so we talked about the rainbow assortment, and this is what we're typically eating. Are you seeing the two eggs with the sausage mouth yeah. or the bacon mouth? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, the brown, yellow, and white food scenario, right? So it's almost like, you know, how can we get more color? So nature's color wheel. Um, and I mentioned these advanced glycation end products where we have the carbohydrate and the protein under the influence of heat giving us those browning products, which when we start to consume those long term, we start to get signs and symptoms of inflammation, which is a marker of aging. All right, so how do we get more fruits and vegetables? That's really the takeaway here. How do we apply this? Well, one idea is to try one new fruit or vegetable per week, and I really like to explore different ones. You know, exploring ethnic grocery stores, like there's an Asian food market here in Port Orchard. Trying bitter melon. Um, if you go to a place like Central Market in Polsbo or markets that are a bit more expansive and have more uh, variety, you can try out different things, like even star fruit, which is a fascinating fruit and has different phytochemicals than your average apple or orange. Stocking up on frozen vegetables for easy cooking, that's really important, too, because you want to be sure that you've got vegetables at your fingertips. If you don't have the time to slice and dice them and get them ready for prep, uh, then just make sure that you already have them prepared in that way so you can toss them into a stir fry. Use the fruits and vegetables that go bad easily first. Save the harder, hardier varieties for later use. So that, um, you know, many people complain about fruits and vegetables because they say, oh, well, the reason I don't buy them is because they go bad so quickly. So what I would say here is use up those first. If you have fragile lettuce and um, different greens, you might want to make sure that you're incorporating more of those um, on a more regular basis. Keep fruits and vegetables where you can see them. It's an old adage, but it's really true. Um, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. If you see them and you can see the colors, you kind of tap into them and, and you might even start thinking creatively about how you can incorporate them. Keep a bowl of fresh cut vegetables on the top shelf of the refrigerator. Why do I say top shelf? 
because that is going to be where your your vision goes, where your first sight um, goes when you when you open that refrigerator. You're you're going to be looking up high, or at least at eye level. I like the top shelf because that's really where most of the light is, and there's nothing obstructing the view. So I think that that's um, that's good to to acknowledge. All right. Keep a fruit bowl on the kitchen counter, table, or desk at work. Watch for the different foods that you put on your, your desk at work. This is really key. They did a study. Brian Wansing talks about this in Mindless Eating. They did an experiment with secretaries where they put opaque glass bowls and translucent or transparent glass bowls full of candy in each of them. And essentially what they found is that people ate more when they could see the candy in the transparent glass bowl versus the opaque where it was covered up and, and not as, um, well, it wasn't within their scope of vision. Pack fruits and vegetables in a purse or a briefcase. Um, for people that are concerned about getting messy with peeling an orange or um, eating a banana, you might want to bring some moist towelettes with you to help you clean up. But essentially, this is one of the best, easiest um, foods that are portable, it are these fruits and vegetables. Choose fruit for dessert. One of my favorite recipes is to make fruit kebabs, where you take um, a red fruit, an orange fruit, basically all the different colors of the rainbow, and you put that on a skewer. Kids love this, and it's also very eye-catching for things like barbecues. Have dishes with lots of vegetable variety. When you get lots of variety, you're going to be getting the variety of different phytochemicals. So having things like broccoli and kale and carrots and red pepper, um, that really brings together the, the whole red, orange, yellow, and green spectrum. And you're going to be getting different phytochemicals based on the different types of vegetables. You can also weave in vegetables in sauces, so making and, and also soups. So if you don't like eating them, there are other ways to, to disguise them and get them into your, your everyday eating. And as a general rule of thumb, it's better to choose darker vegetables over lighter vegetables. Darker usually denotes more concentration, more density of these phytonutrients. So here are some other tips. Um, switching from mashed potatoes to sliced carrots, and I might even say, um, cauliflower, mashed cauliflower. There's a great recipe on, it's, it's called, I can't believe it's not mashed potatoes. It's essentially taking cauliflower, steaming it, blending it with some coconut milk and some um, olive oil with some pepper and some garlic, and it becomes almost like a mashed potato. It tastes really good, especially if it's very warm. Uh, switching from corn, which is very starchy, to spinach. And get more uh, fun nutrients there, especially the chlorophyll. But corn also has some redeeming factors. The fact that corn has lutein is a good thing, but spinach and kale also have um, good amounts of lutein, which is the yellow component that we need for good, healthy eyes. You might want to try tossing in some red bell pepper, tomato sauce, garlic, onions, or broccoli into whether it's pasta or um, any other type of dish um, even a vegetable dish. Adding rinds of oranges or lemons to water chicken or fish. Now, if you're using the rind, make sure you wash the orange or lemon very, very well because the, the rind or the, the peel on these fruits tend to collect a lot of pesticides and waxy um, type of substances to ward off pests. So just make sure that you scrub them really well before you let them sit within a, a pitcher of water because you'll be getting everything on that rind. Uh, also, when you use lemons or acid in this way, whether um, apple cider vinegar or lemon juice or lime juice, and you put it on things like chicken or fish, it acts as a tenderizer and it helps to really break down some of that protein just initially so it makes it easier to digest. Fruit salads are great because they, they do give you, just like those fruit kebabs, they give you a whole variety of different fruits. And you can use orange juice or apple juice to kind of seal the fruits together in a bowl. Try a little bit of every color at a salad bar. Uh, the only thing about a salad bar I would say to you is 
be careful uh, to not try too many things. <laughs> you know, when they look at um, variety, variety is a really good thing for, for us in our eating. It, it exposes us to different phytonutrients. But sometimes when we go to a salad bar, we are just inundated with all that variety, and we want to try everything. So we end up eating more than we really need to. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you do choose to eat at a buffet style or a salad bar type setting, that it is truly a salad bar rather than a salad bar combined with warm meals and, you know, kind of an extensive buffet. Uh, also, writing down what you eat in a day and using markers or crayons to highlight the colors that you are eating. Let's say that you don't really know if you're lacking any particular color. Well, what you can do is just write down for three consecutive days. Make sure you get one weekend day and two weekdays, like, um, a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and see if you eat differently on the weekend versus the weekdays with respect to your fruits and vegetables. In fact, in this paper on the Victorian um, England era, they were getting about 8 to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day, which I just found remarkable. So when it comes to color, really, really important here. So green um, it's worthwhile to note that sir, a serving of cooked kale provides triple the amount of lutein and zeaxanthin, two very important carotenoids for us, um, as a serving of raw spinach. So, of course, we think of spinach as kind of that Popeye food, very fortifying, high in iron, high in chlorophyll, and it is all those things. It is very healthy, but kale is, in my opinion, a, a much more um, superior food when it comes to lutein. Red, what about red? A serving of guava, and guava is not that common, of course, but guava delivers more than one and a half times the lycopene in a raw tomato. Now, when you cook tomato, you actually make the lycopene more bioavailable. You make it more readily absorbable by the body. So keep that in mind, too. With yellow and orange, you might think of carrots or sweet potatoes. A serving of sweet potatoes has nearly double the beta carotene, and you all know that beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A, and vitamin A is needed for the immune system, for good healthy vision, for uh, wound healing, so it's used throughout the body. So sweet potatoes is actually better in beta carotene than carrots. And you might even think, well, I've always known carrots to be the source of beta carotene. Well, it is. It's just that there are some other sources that um, have greater amounts. A serving of carrots delivers four times the amount of alpha carotene, a different type of carotene, um, compared to a serving of winter squash. And finally, a serving of fresh papaya has roughly ten times the amount of another carotenoid called beta cryptoxanthin compared with an orange. So again, just some, uh, some different foods to think about. Sometimes we get into our food ruts when we start doing corn and spinach and carrots and we, we don't broaden our horizon. So that's what I'm encouraging you to do is to try out some different foods. It's also really important um, to reduce your exposure to pesticides. And you can do that by, again, focusing on reducing foods that concentrate these pesticides, things like animal products that we spoke about. Buying organically grown produce is also important. Keep in mind, though, that even 30% of organically grown produce tends to be um, contaminated in some way with some type of insecticide, herbicide, or pesticide. So even the organically grown produce can be contaminated, so wash them very well. Try to buy local produce in season and peel off the skin or remove the outer layers of leaves of some produce. Now, I think of this when I think of like a head of cabbage. There are lots of leaves there, so you can peel off the first layer so that you're removing the, um, if it was sprayed or contaminated, you're removing that layer. You don't want to um, peel the skin off of all of the fruits and vegetables that you're, that you're eating sometimes. Like as an example, I commonly, very frequently, eat a kiwi even with the skin on because I think it's great to get that extra fiber. Uh, some people kind of wrinkle their nose at that, but um, 
it actually tastes really good. And because the, the kiwi is, um, the inner part is so sugar dense, I think it's important to get some of the fiber. Now, apples are one of the biggest offenders when it comes to the, what they call the dirty dozen with respect to accumulating a lot of pesticides. So an apple, it's really good to get the fiber that you get from the skin, and it is pretty easy to wash. So you might just want to take care in washing uh, that as best you can. And then also you can use lots of different um, different solutions that they have on the market now, like BioClean has a nice one that's based on grapefruit seed extract. I basically fill up my sink with soapy water and I take my vegetable scrub brush and I do wash the vegetables. And I like to do that when I first get them and bring them into the house so I don't get further contamination. So I mentioned the, that vegetable scrub brush before. Um, you can find these, they're not very expensive. And it's also worthwhile to think about replacing them on a monthly basis, just like you would a sponge. They're, um, you know, they're, they're, they tend to be very rough and, and fibrous, but, you know, you're still collecting some debris. In terms of other tips on clean eating, really important to wash your hands um, to get them ready uh, before preparing fresh produce, cutting away any damaged or bruised areas uh, of the fruit or vegetable before you um, eat them, gently rubbing the produce while holding under plain running water. Um, I do think what, what the studies have shown is that mechanical motion or rubbing um, with a brush or making sure that you, you have some mechanical force to dislodge the pesticides or any kind of residue on there is probably the most effective. I do think that using soap um, or a produce wash is also helpful in that regard. Um, this is coming from the FDA.gov site, but I do think that including soap um, is a really nice um, addition to that. Wash produce before you peel it so dirt and bacteria aren't transferred from the knife onto the fruit or vegetable. That's good common sense. And as I mentioned, using that vegetable brush, drying the produce with a clean cloth or paper towel to further reduce bacteria that may be present. And as I mentioned, throwing away the outermost leaves. So if you don't have this already, I would recommend going to the Environmental Working Group site and downloading this for yourself. So you can also find this at foodnews.org. You can find a list of the Dirty Dozen. These are the ones that are recommended to buy as organic. So apples, celery, and strawberries are the top three. The Clean 15 are the lowest in pesticides, and these would be things that potentially you don't have to buy organic. Onions, corn, and pineapples. Now let me just put in a little disclaimer here. Corn. Um, much of corn that is grown today is genetically modified corn. And one of the stipulations of organically grown produce is that it is not GMO. So if you are um, conscious of genetically modified organisms and have some concern about that, then I would advise that you buy organically grown corn rather than conventionally grown. All right, um, the next one is note how you are eating. Uh, if you're doing a lot of dashboard dining, probably not the best thing to helping you to retain your vitality. It's really important to retain uh, that sense of mindfulness or awareness with eating. Number six is including high-potency antioxidant foods. One of my favorite ones is what I'm showing right here, which are the blueberries. There are lots of these different high-potency antioxidant foods, things like the crucifers. These are the cruciferous vegetables, which are wonderful anti-cancer foods. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, Swiss chard, parsnips, watercress, bok choy, collard, and mustard greens. Wonderful choices for getting those, those detoxification components. Garlic is also one of those great um, wonder foods. And if you are, and it's actually used for so many different purposes. It can be used as an antiviral. It helps with our immune system. It helps with our cholesterol levels. And so um, if you're wanting to use it for its antiviral properties, it's often recommended to have it raw. Now, if you've got digestive upset or have a lot of um, esophageal reflux, you might not want to do that. It might be better just to to cook the garlic a little bit, you'll still be getting some benefit. 
Turmeric. Oh, my goodness. One of my favorites. Um, so protective of so many different systems in the body. Um, you can buy turmeric as a spice. It's often uh, put into curries. So, and I put it into a lot of different things. Like I make a, um, a dish with tofu that has vegetables and um, curry um, sprinkled onto it. But sometimes I'll just make a fish curry. I spoke about that in a previous webinar. Really tasty and does give that added zing. Green tea is another great um, beverage. So here's um, some different ways to, to use green tea. Um, and to prepare it, so allowing 8 to 10 minute brewing period in order to maximize um, a lot of the compounds that are released from the green tea, getting about three cups per day, and choosing decaffeinated versions if at all possible so you don't have the effect of the caffeine. And I have here one type of green tea that is highest in one of the components of green tea called epigallocatechin gallate. This is one of those compounds that seems to be very medicinal for a number of different things in the body. Okay. Berries, uh, I've already mentioned those. That was uh, the first one on the slide. High content of anti-cancer polyphenols. Cranberries and blueberries have the highest content of antioxidants. Um, and especially the, the blueberries that are stressed or grown in the maritime region. Um, you can find those at Trader Joe's, actually, in the freezer section. Tomatoes. Tomatoes have uh, lycopene, which is wonderful for the prostate gland for men and also for the immune and cardiovascular systems. Lycopene is highest in tomato paste. Why? Because it's concentrated. And also, if you're cooking it, you're going to help with the bioavailability of lycopene. It's also um, important to think about the context in which a lot of these foods are eaten. So lycopene needs a little bit of fat to be absorbed. So that's why I like the idea of having with a little bit of olive oil or some other type of fat to maximize its uptake into the body. Cocoa, everybody's favorite, <laughs> maybe. Um, dark chocolate. Now, there's, there's so much here, but essentially what we're looking for are the cocoa polyphenols that are – protective for the body, are great for the cardiovascular system, high in these polyphenols. And what you do want to watch for, however, is the amount of sugar and fat in the chocolate products that are on the market. So a milk chocolate is not going to be as healthful as a dark chocolate with 70% or greater amounts of cocoa. Number seven, choose foods that help your body detoxify and eliminate waste. There are certain foods that help our body to naturally process toxins, and a lot of those nutrients impact liver function. So there are different ways to eliminate toxins. You can do it through the stool, which, which is very much why I, I get concerned when people have constipation, because I think about how those toxins are staying in the body. They're not being eliminated. Urine will also be another way that we re release toxins from the body. So if we're properly hydrated and uh, we're taking in enough fluid, we're um, essentially creating a, a flow of those compounds out of the body. Skin in the form of um, sweat and just even through exercise or hydrotherapy or infrared sauna use, we're leveraging our body's big surface area in order to excrete a number of those different toxins. Fiber is so important for helping the gut to be regular. So it traps those toxins. There are two different types of fiber. They're both very good um, for the body and for the gut. We get too little in the way of fiber. Typically we get about 11 grams, well, roughly about 11 to 15 grams per day. But we really need two and a half times to, to three times that. We need 30 to 50 grams per day, depending on the amount of calories that you take in. The fiber works as well as um, your ability to be hydrated. Soluble fiber especially works best in the presence of water. So it, it kind of becomes this viscous-like gel that slowly can then move through the gut and start trapping toxins, kind of like a net. 
If you decide to use a fiber supplement, just make sure that you go very slow uh, in terms of ramping up your, your gut so that you don't get a lot of gas and bloating. Best food sources of fiber include fruit with the skin, especially berries, things like blackberries and blueberries. Legumes are wonderful for their fiber content, really rich sources of fiber. Half a cup of black beans, I believe, supplies about eight grams of fiber. It's a lot. Non-starchy vegetables are also great, as well as nuts and whole grains are all good sources of fiber. If you want to help your liver to detoxify the things that you're taking into your environment, you need a couple of things. It's not possible to do a, a fast type of detoxification in a successful way, especially if you have different underlying chronic conditions. In fact, many times um, it, it's, it's a really smart way to detox by, by using nutrients. We can help facilitate those, new, those toxins out of the body that way. So things like protein are needed for the liver. Certain vitamins, B vitamins, vitamin C are also helpful. Uh, pomegranate, certain actives in pomegranate like elagic acid can be important, as well as turmeric, I've mentioned that before, and cruciferous vegetables. So lots of different um, things that you can be eating. And one I didn't write on here, but lemon, lemon bioflavonoids are also phenomenal, which is why lemons incorporated into a cleanse can be very medicinal and, and healing when it comes to helping the liver. Hydration, it's really important to make sure that you're getting enough in the way of, um, of water. And the general rule of thumb is to take your body weight divided by two, and that's the rule of thumb with respect to ounces. Now, you probably don't want to exceed about 100 ounces of water per day. So just keep that in mind. And you can always gauge your water intake by looking at the color of your urine, making sure it's not too dark, not too light. Um, and, and certain vitamins will also change the color of your urine as well. So roughly between six to eight glasses, eight ounce glasses of bottled, filtered, or purified water, um, different herbal iced teas, keeping a bottle with you at all times, and making sure it's a glass or a stainless steel bottle rather than a plastic one, eating more soups and stews and other watery foods. They tend to be easier to digest. Now, I'm also thinking about people that might be going through chemotherapy and might be um, having issues with their digestive tract, right? So freezing ice pops made with weak fruit juice and water and sucking on them when your mouth is sore, drinking fluids between meals, and juicing fresh vegetables and fruits for variety. Things that contain caffeine or, or alcohol might actually be dehydrating. Skin, it's so important to um, take care of our skin. Those omega-3 fatty acids can be really important for keeping our skin healthy. And also looking at your personal care products. What are you eating through your skin? Reading the labels of your personal care products like you would your food products. So infrared sauna use, skin brushing, all really good ways to stimulate the skin. Another great way to release toxins is through deep belly breathing. One of my favorite exercises is inhaling for the count of four, holding it for the count of four, exhaling it for the count of four, and holding for the count of four, and then repeating that. And really getting deep into the belly area so that you get some movement in the area of the intestines. Now, keep in mind that um, when we started out talking about visualizing our success, the reason why I mention that is because changing your thoughts and feelings can change your brain activity. In fact, I think it's really interesting that um, when they did PET scans of people that were playing the piano versus not playing the piano, um, but imagining that they were playing the piano, that they could see some similarities between the two. So when we set forth those brain patterns, we start to create a template for change in our body and mind. The blue zones, uh, these are the people that are living these long lives. What makes them different? They move naturally. They eat until they're no longer hungry. 
not until they're full, but until they're no longer hungry. They eat a lot of plant foods. They have uh, medicinal beverages like green tea and red wine. They have a sense of purpose. They also have the ability to downshift or to reduce the stress level in their lives. These individuals also, um, these pockets of the, the population that tend to live long into their 100s, also what they find is that these individuals have strong networks. They tend to belong to certain groups. They um, have a sense of priorities in terms of putting their loved ones first and connecting to communities that are supportive and that mirror the behaviors and actions that they need to take on. So I'm going to take you through some, uh, some quick food continuums uh, in terms of food choices. So I've already talked about a lot of the different foods, and sometimes you may feel like you can't just make that leap just yet. You, your brain pattern might be in the mode of taking you towards a healthy, vital life, but you need some transition in order to get there. So here are some healthier food choices. Reducing your intake of red meat, substituting with things like fish and poultry. Instead of hamburgers and hot dogs, what about lamb burgers? What about lean beef burgers, chicken sausages? Instead of eggs, um, egg beaters. High-fat dairy products, substituting for low-fat or non-fat products. Butter and lard, um, substituting with olive oil, especially if you're doing lots of butter or lard. We, we talked about butter that... You know, it, it's probably not all that terrible because it's got the short-chain fatty acids that are used by the body. But in excess, this can become an issue. So switching that up every now and then with something like olive oil. Instead of ice cream, pies, cake, and cookies, substituting with those beautiful rainbow fruit kebabs or a fruit salad. Instead of fried foods and fatty snacks, getting some vegetables with hummus and nuts. And instead of coffee and soft drinks, herbal teas, green tea, fresh fruit, and vegetable juices. So instead of colas, as I mentioned, those, those fruit or vegetable juices will be wonderful to substitute, as well as uh, green tea with lemon, or even having water with a twist of different fruits put inside. Green tea is also a great substitute. And as I mentioned, the hamburgers, um, you really want to make sure that you're, you're choosing good, healthful, lean meat if you do choose to have the burger and loading it up with vegetables. So um, with organic beef, you can add in garlic, flaxseed, and onion. Add a little bit of fiber to your, um, your burger. Salmon, a salmon burger would be very healthful. Veggie burgers or even having a portobello mushroom is a great alternative. Adding some cinnamon can also um, help as a nice alternative. It adds a nice flavor to certain products, even to vegetables, and it may also help with blood sugar um, as well as blood lipids. What about portion sizes and eating frequency? Really important not to skip meals so that you don't start breaking down your muscle for energy. So three small meals a day with some intermittent snacks, can help to stabilize blood sugar and insulin. When it comes to balancing your plate, the way I think of it is dividing your plate into three sections, with half of it being vegetables and salad, a quarter of it being mixed whole grains or some type of starch, if that's what you prefer, so something like a brown rice or a quinoa, and then 25% being protein, poultry, fish, um, beans, or soy products. I also want to bring in, as uh, Elaine mentioned when we first got on the call, one of the aspects that I think will help people to really implement change is to recognize how our relationship to food and eating represents our relationship to everything else. And if we see eating as a metaphor or as symbolic, it may give us a lot of insight into what is going on in our lives. So the question is, what if we looked at the deeper symbolic meaning of food, right? You know, what if we were looking at, well, why are we eating so many sweet foods? Is there something more going on there? Are, are we lacking sweetness in our lives? So there's lots of different symbolism for the foods that we select. Um, maybe instead of feeling fulfilled in our everyday life, 
we may instead choose to fill the stomach or feel content and satisfied in that way. Hungry, what are we really hungry for? Are we quenching a bodily need or are we being hungry for connection and for meaning in life? And craving, if we have a food craving, are we truly looking for a food or taste, a flavor, sensation, or are we craving something more? Are we craving depth and warmth and connection? So that's just some food for thought. I think it's interesting to look at the physiology and the philosophy or the symbology of the foods that we are drawn to. I also want to close with um, briefly mentioning movement. So when we're talking about lifestyle change, envisioning your success, movement is also really important to bring in. And there are lots of different ways to be active. You can be physically active. You can be emotionally active. You can be mentally active. You want to keep all of those going. So whatever you call it, if you want to call it the E-word exercise or gentle movement therapy or being active, it's really important to be sure that you're getting some flow. The reason why it's important to get flow is because you want to keep those nutrients and oxygen and your circulation moving through you. In some ancient medical systems, they call this chi or prana or life force. So that will continue to circulate through us. Now, if you feel like it's a struggle for you to get your activity requirements, What's really interesting here is that um, having a dog and, and walking a dog might be one sure way to get your activity in. There, there was a study that was published showing that dog walkers achieved 150 minutes of physical activity per week than owners who did not walk with their dog. Strength training, keeping your lean body mass um, fit and, and um, making sure that it's robust. You also want to remember that um, more repetitions with less weight might be a good way for you to start initially. And you also need the calories and the protein in order to help build that muscle. So if your goal is to lose fat and maintain lean body mass, two times per week for strength training. If you want to increase and create more bulk, typically three to four times per week is what is advocated. Flexibility. So it's important to retain our flexibility, our ability to move gracefully and agile with agility. Our muscle fibers tend to shorten if we're not using them, and our joint connective tissue can weaken. So stretching improves flexibility. I know that Elaine loves this picture of the cat. Stretching out full force um, definitely helps us to create that sense of expansion in our muscles and also better circulation. With stretching properly, you definitely want to go slow um, to, to hold those stretches for a little bit. And in fact, uh, if you can stretch after exercising, that's typically a good idea just to make sure that um, you're, you're kind of bringing your body, cooling it down and allowing those muscle fibers to, to spring back. Emotional fitness. It, we talked a little bit about emotional eating, and as I mentioned to Elaine, I think it's important to probably do a whole webinar on emotional eating. What are the feelings that you feel, and how do you identify those feelings? How do you express them? Do you create a log? Do you confront those emotions? Do you actually make time to feel those emotions? Really important um, in order to, to keep good emotional health. By laughing, laughter is great medicine. Typically, it causes a, an increase in energy expenditure. We can actually burn calories if we're laughing. So that's a good thing to, to remember. Mental fitness, keeping sharp. This is the whole aspect of use it or lose it. So if we are sharp in our mind, we're constantly uh, pushing the boundaries of our intellect and our problem-solving ability, changing things up, this is really good for neuronal plasticity. Now, I really like some of these activities that are listed here because they tend to bring exactly what we've been talking about, the physical body, the emotional state, and the mental thought patterns together, things like Tai Chi, things like yoga and Qigong. Massage can also be one way to get some exercise in a very passive way. We're moving things through the body, but if we don't have the energy, we might um, want to treat ourselves to a massage. 
and stress. You know, there are different forms of stress. There's acute stress, there's chronic stress, and it's the chronic stress over time that can really be a barrier to our health. In fact, um, you know, looking at what we expose ourselves to, sometimes we've got too much stress in our environment. We're watching violent movies. We're changing our, our physiology just by the external stimuli that we're putting into our eyes or that we're perceiving. When it comes to having all that stress, um, it's really good to ensure that we have a, a, a way to, to vent it. And we don't want to impulsively vent the stress or the emotions that come along with it, but we also don't want to store those feelings. So for people who have good self-regulation techniques, they're able to have a longer lifespan and health span. So in terms of uh, stress and developing alternatives, how can you change up your structure? How can you get some change? What do you need to change so that you can get yourself out of the rut of stress? There are lots of different ways to manage stress through relaxation techniques, through lifestyle strategies, through activity, getting good healthy sleep, and of course, eating the foods that we've been talking about today, the high antioxidant foods can also help. Different breathing techniques, I mentioned the deep belly breath, meditation, and yoga, and as many of you know, uh, we do lots of yoga classes at Harmony Hill. I mentioned the four square breathing, you can practice breathing at any and, and, and all times. You can practice it while you're driving. If you're waiting in line to, uh, to purchase groceries at the grocery store, there are many opportunities to be aware of our breath. In fact, uh, progressive relaxation, tensing up certain muscle groups and then letting go to help that coordination between our muscles and our breath. Meditation. Uh, really wonderful for, for helping the body to push that inner reset button, especially with respect to all the thoughts that we have. And I'm a big fan of yoga. Yoga is great for stress reduction. It's not a competitive sport. You basically um, go with yoga where, where you're at, right? You, you don't want to overdo it. You really want to use it as a way to unify your body, mind, and spirit. Time management. Gosh, uh, setting priorities, this can also help with stress. Organizing your day, delegating if you can. Uh, don't overschedule and let go of trying to get it all done. Animal therapy, surrounding yourself with animals, I think can be very important. And in fact, what we see in the studies is that they help us to be more vital. They help us to ward off loneliness, to reduce anxiety, to provide some form of contact and comfort. Okay, let's see here. <laughs> My screen. Okay, um, art, music, and dance therapy also really important um, because it helps us to relieve a lot of the stress. It allows us to flow better. Sound. Um, you may know that um, sound therapy is being used now at hospitals. That sound has incredible um, ability to heal especially certain soothing sounds, classical music and such. Lots of nice studies that are coming out now showing about how music listening may have a beneficial effect on blood pressure and heart rate and reducing anxiety. So exercise is, is good. You want to be sure you get adequate rest and sleep, not to be underestimated. And when it comes to food and reducing stress, really limiting your caffeine, limiting or avoiding alcohol, allowing your blood sugar to stay balanced by eating in a regular way, and reducing those simple sugary carbohydrates. There are certain vitamins that are used for stress, like vitamin C, vitamin B5, B6, zinc, magnesium, and different botanicals, things like the adaptogens. So when we see stress as a potential to transform that's where the stress works for us rather than against us. So how do you make the change? You can use a journal. We've been talking about that a little bit, where you write down your, your habits so that you actually know what you're doing. And keep in mind, be patient with yourself, because it does take 45 days to change a habit, and it takes seven days, only seven days, to get that habit back. So you've really got to work at it. 
sometimes we're just in the pre-contemplation stage where we're just not even thinking about it for ourselves. And then we kind of move through to the point where we finally get to that stage of action. And sometimes it's kind of spiral. It doesn't always go linearly. Sometimes we regress or we move backwards. And again, I think that the important part of this is to be patient, to continue with that awareness. So I'll close there. Um, I've got a number of books which really do address a number of the topics that we spoke of. I also have a Facebook page, and Harmony Hill has a Facebook page as well. So feel, f feel free to join in to the conversation that we have around food and around health. And I'd like to thank you very much for your participation tonight and also being a part of this whole webinar series. Thanks so Deanna, much. thank you. Thank you so much for joining us over the last four weeks. And, again, a reminder to everybody, you can see Deanna up here on the Hill on August 25th at the Survivorship Fair. And, um, and we'll be coming out to you with a survey to get your feedback and look for an announcement of the series continuing in October in depth on some topics and reformatted uh, according to what you all would like to hear about and in the format. So, it, and again, I encourage you if you missed some of the sessions or would like to review this one, you can get you can have access to them at HarmonyHill.org. Deanna, you're wonderful. We're so lucky to have you as a resource. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. And I look forward to our, our next series in October. Great. And we'll thank you all for participating this evening, and we'll see you on the 25th of August. Bye now. Bye-bye.